everyone for coming today and um, Delta Sigma Pi for putting this on. And thank you to our panelists for coming all the way down to Roger Williams to speak to us. I really appreciate it. I think it's going to be a great event. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is a great turnout. Um, I, Joe, I hope you can hear me in the back. Okay. Usually the mic and I don't get along. So tonight, the format is going to be very informal. I have some questions, but I also asked each of you to prepare questions. This event is really for you, um, knowing what's you know, coming down the pike. How many of you are seniors? Okay, so I am expecting lots of questions tonight. How many of you are juniors? Terrific, because you're gonna to need to know the answers to those questions to be better prepared. So I thought the way we would kick it off, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Susan Casey, I'm the Associate Director of the Career Center. So I see many familiar faces. Um, in the audience tonight is Steve Cantine. Steve is our new Associate Dean of the Career Center. So if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself to Stephen, um, you, know, you can go ahead and do that at any point. So why don't we get started? I know that um, we're scheduled to go until 6, 6.30 based on the Q&A. I don't think anyone in this audience is shy, so I'm expecting to hear your questions. Okay. I thought just as a way to kick off the panel, I'd have each one of the panelists we're very lucky to have such a great panel tonight and lots of HR knowledge um, and industry knowledge to boot. So the questions you have, I'm sure, won't be the first time that our panelists are gonna be hearing them. And who better than a panel of HR professionals to answer your questions? You can ask pretty much anything from our non-judgmental free panel um, without worrying about having a job on the line. So if there are those burning questions that you needed to know the answers to before the interview, now is the time to ask those questions. So, um, Tony, why don't we start with you? I'll have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll move straight down the panel. My name is Tony Pivarato. I'm senior partner at a retained executive search practice that's headquartered and located out of Providence, Rhode Island. I grew up in the great state of Vermont. I just say that because one of the panelists said, man, you're from Vermont, aren't you? Um, I uh, counted the cows and counted the people one day when I was driving back from St. Michael's College and decided it was time for me, for me to leave the state of Vermont. So I spent 20 years and 23 days as a member of the United States Air Force, the last 14 years as an Air Force recruiter. Retired at 38, figured I was done, but my wife told me I had to get a job, a real one. So I started uh, with MSI and have been there for about 17 years um, and enjoying life in the big city of Providence. Beth? So I'm totally the opposite of Tony. My name is Beth Carter. I grew up in Bronxville, New York. So I grew up a half hour outside of Manhattan, but I am a Bryant University alum. I do have my MBA from Baruch in Manhattan as well. Um, I worked for KPMG and Ernst & Young in their executive search groups many, many years ago, and about 24 plus years ago, I started Carter Consultants, so I own an international executive search firm. And then in 2008, I went back and got certified as a professional coach, so I do executive business and career coaching. And I moved to, the, and I lived in Fairfield, Connecticut for many years, and moved here about three years, less than three years ago, to Warren, Rhode Island. And so, um, and this is actually my second time speaking at Roger Williams, so I'm happy to be here and answer all your questions. My name is Bernhard Erb, shorten it to Bern because nobody can pronounce the German pronunciation of Bernard. Um, I'm a Department of Defense kid who was raised all over the world, mostly in Germany. Um, and I, my career path went through East Chester, New York. So we were talking about Bronxville and East Chester, which are right next to each other. And started in a company that was a distributor of hardware technology back in the 90s. It was about a $70 million company, helped grow it to a $2 billion company before I left. Um, now I'm a partner, business owner with um, Tim Carey, who is, who's spoken here before. And we have a medical device 
and um, pharmaceutical inside sales organization. We help medical device and pharmaceutical companies with what their goals. We actually sell as their representatives. So Johnson & Johnson is one of our clients. When our sales reps call, they don't call from Sagamore, which is our company. They call from um, Johnson & Johnson. And so it gives us a lot of ability to sell and, and be successful. Anyway, we hire mostly entry level people. Um, and we started the company about five years ago, six years ago, and we're on a good growth path right now. And we're looking to hire people over the next year. And um, that's it. So at the Career Center, we spend quite a bit of time talking to students about the value of internships. Internships, co-curricular activities, leadership experience. Um, Tony, could you speak to the value of internships and leadership experience when you look at resumes? When I'm looking at an intern, from an intern standpoint or from after well, from, they graduate? And after, maybe after the fall, um, seeking that full-time position. I'm going to key on the internships, but I'm going to key on the specific tasks that were accomplished at the interns uh, program. There are many internships that are filing, typing. You don't really do a lot of great stuff. But I want to talk to them about specifics. Share with me a typical day in your internship. What were some of the projects that you had to do that were outside of the internship? I'll ask if it's paid or unpaid. Traditionally, paid internships are really good um, and, and those types of things. I also want to know how many interns were with you during your internship. Why? Where were you within that particular group? Were you a project lead? Did you assist and train other interns? I'm looking for leadership. I'm trying to find foundational leadership skills wherever I can in that, uh, in that kind of that venue. Does that answer your question? It answers my Thank question. Thank you. And hopefully it answers your question on why you should be doing internships and multiple internships. I will share that um, one of our more successful hires uh, was an intern with us. It was the first time we had ever hired this person. She's an absolute rock star. We had never, ever, ever hired an intern. We sent them out to other retained firms um, throughout the United States, and this one we kept, and she is incredible. So internships do work, and you can be hired after an internship, so do a good job. Okay, terrific. So Beth, from your experience, are there certain items that you look for when you're reviewing resumes for entry-level positions? Are there certain things that stand out in your mind as you're going through resumes for a particular position? Well, I don't mean to say hire a lot of interns, but I do. Or for entry level. Or, and well, even that a little bit. I don't do a lot of that. But one of the things, I mean, Tony touched upon it with the leadership piece, but I'm also looking for diversity. I mean, I like the fact that if your major is one thing, maybe try something in a different area. I mean, it's been told that the millennials are going to be having probably about 30 jobs over your lifetime versus I had them like eight, my parents had one or two. So it's nice to be able to experience different things because no matter what you do, if you change industries and stuff, it gives you a whole different network, it gives you a whole different way of looking at things. And you bring that to the table even 20 years later. Um, so I think that if you have opportunities to try some, don't always stick in the same industry or, or look outside the box a little bit. So if you say, well, maybe this internship's not exactly right for me, but you can get some of the soft skills like the leadership or project management or be exposed to those projects outside the box, I would take full advantage of it. Because to be honest with you, you know, when I'm recruiting even executives and I go through their history, it's fascinating to me how they made the moves they made. And a lot of it's got to do with also who they know and what, what they, you know, instead of what they know. And industries, as we know, some die and some, you know, resurrect. But the idea is if you have a diverse industry base, then you can, um, I just think you're more marketable down the road. So you have to think today, of course, because you all want your first job. But keep in mind that, you know, you need to think further out as well. One of the items that we spend a lot of time talking about in the career planning seminar or even at the career center in our one-on-one -on -one appointments, it's really the value of networking and informational interviews. So as students are just starting out, you know, starting their careers, Bern, can you speak to the value of networking and also um, LinkedIn, possibly? Yeah, so, you know, here's the thing. People use LinkedIn in particular as a way of put, meeting every single person they can. They, there's a, the whole 
um, lie-in group where they've linked into every single person that they possibly can. Um, that's not networking. What that is is that linking to every single person you can just because people will accept the, the link. Networking is actually getting to know people, getting to work with people, and developing relationships. We've talked about leadership and about the, the value of that and the, the value of um, being diversified. It's really getting to know people and developing relationships that are long term. Tim and I came from the same company. We went different paths. We came back together and started a company together. So it's really about working those relationships, following people's careers is the point of LinkedIn. It's not necessarily simply, you know, you, you see the three of us at, at today, and so you say, well, I'm going to go link to each one of them because um, they, were, they came and spoke at, at the school. That's not the way it works. It's really about what have you done, what's the community that you're involved in, and how have you built those relationships. Terrific. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Is there anyone who wants to start, um, maybe stump the panel with a question? Lindsay. <laughs> sure. He says he doesn't know what he will do. Okay, so um, I've had an internship over the summer and it progressed to the fall as well. So um, I'll be graduating in the spring. So I was just wondering when's a good time to start like asking them if it could like potentially be like full time. Like we've talked about it um, a little bit, but I just don't know like when's a good time and how to ask. Who do you, who, which person on the panel would you like? I'll, I'll, I'll take it because right. we, have, we have an intern, and our intern has made a... Tony Beth No, yeah. Anyway. I, I, we, we have an intern, and, and our intern is somebody that we'd really like to hire. Um, hopefully he's not here. I don't, he already knows that, but I don't want to call him out in front of everybody else. Um, if, there, if you're somebody that's doing what you're supposed to do, you're, you're shaking it up as an intern, then I think it's appropriate any time. Our intern isn't going to be graduating until May, and... and He's already talking pretty earnestly about it with us. So if we have an opening at that time, he's likely to get it. I worked with someone from Bryant University. As I said, I do a lot of work at Bryant. And he graduated in May. And he had an internship kind of similar to you, worked the summer, worked the fall. And he started you know, talking to them about it. And what came out was is that they weren't going to be able to hire anyone come like the summer so the thing is is if you don't mention it now one they don't know what your interest level is but more importantly there might be reasons why they can't so you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket either so I mean I would I would definitely have what's the worst that you're gonna hear is maybe we'll you know we can't talk about it now we'll we'll address it in three months and just mark it on your calendar kind of thing so I don't, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to at least start having the conversation and, and I would agree. From the first interview when you're interning, ask them, is this a potential for full-time employment, assuming ambition and success? And then as you're going through your weeks and months of your internship, meet with, your per, meet with the, whoever your boss is or whoever your supervisor is on a weekly or twice a month to say, listen, how am I progressing as far in your eyes? Are there areas where you feel that I should improve? Are there areas when you're looking at a new employee that I can maybe do, be better at? Have that open dialogue and communication, and, and don't ever let you, please, I can't read minds. I have daughters and I still can't read minds, okay? <laughs> so, so I'm not gonna know if you wanna be here unless you tell me that you wanna be here, and then show me by the work that you do. Stand out into the workplace. I love when interns show up, my recruiters, I love it. So that's, that, that's good stuff, and thank you. That was an excellent question. Do you know thank Anna? You. Um, okay. this one? Yeah, okay. Mm, not so much. <laughs> um, what's your advice for people planning to move after graduation? Like, how early do you think that you should reach out to employers? Like, for instance, I'm thinking of moving in September. I'm graduating in May. So what do you think is appropriate time to express my interest in a position? Or even maybe for, like, an inter um, informational interview? Where are you thinking of moving to? Nashville. Tennessee, yeah. moonshine. <laughs> That's a lot warmer than Vermont. I guess yeah, it is. You know, going back to Burns' comment about building your network appropriately, I, I mean, my feeling is you plant the seeds. I mean, like I knew I was going to move to Rhode Island probably in two to three years. I actually was not going to move for three more years until my daughter graduated from high school, and I accelerated it. But I started planting seeds 
years before, and I don't think it can hurt you to, you know, start building that network and finding out who knows who and, and take advantage of it. I mean, one good place to start is the Roger Williams alumni, see who are out there and, and kind of go from there. Because as I mentioned about this Brian student, he actually ended up in Indianapolis and a fellow classmate of mine lives in Indy and so I connected the two of them. So it can't hurt to, you know, start and the, there might be things about Nashville that you think is what it is and you may find out it's not or maybe they might say, hey, maybe not Nashville now, look at something else. But it certainly is worth, it's a great way to do your research too, is just to find out if this really is truly what you want to do. And I would certainly visit it if you, ha are you originally from Nashville? No, I just visited and I know it's, I know some people who have moved down there after graduation. Okay, so, so you are I do have those connections, network. but they're in a little bit of a different field than I want. Well, then I would reach out, start with the Roger Williams alumni and go from there. I'm going to tell you, start now. Um, identify a list of organizations that are in the greater Nashville, Smyrna, Tennessee, or within the 50 mile geographics of the center of Nashville. You can use Glassdoor, you can use Indeed.com, and you can literally set up job agents based upon the zip codes. Have that sent to your email boxes. Follow those companies, both on LinkedIn and on Twitter as well. Most, most companies now have a Twitter account. Just be careful and please, I know you heard this on Saturday, for those that were there on Saturday, clean up your Facebook. Clean up your Twitter account. Put your Facebook profiles to private. Don't be, don't be, don't be, don't be, okay? Um, it's just the way it is. I'm telling you right now, the first, I get a call from somebody, the first thing I do is go on LinkedIn. I don't have a Facebook account. I get in trouble all by myself. I don't need Facebook to help me out, okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that you gotta do it because that's what we're gonna look and, I'm, and, and I will bounce somebody who had, you know, God, it was a great night last night, you know? I mean, those types of things. Um, and yes, the university colleges, you need to link in with as many Roger Williams University graduates in that area, just like Beth said. Ask them to link in. I am thinking about coming to the Nashville area in September. I wondered if I, you know, could, could link in with you. May I use you as a resource? I mean, whatever it is, especially if they're working for the companies that you've targeted out there. Um, and just say, as a Roger Williams graduate, you appreciate and understand the value of great education. I'm graduating with Roger Williams. Look, I mean, you can create something that's really good, but do your homework, study for the test. And one, la one last thing I'll say is, is that if you are going to go to Nashville and meet with some of these people, your greatest investment is a cup of coffee, is paying someone, you know, taking someone out for a cup of coffee. I can't reiterate that enough. Um, and the last question, if it is an informational interview, that you should be asking of them is not what can you do for me, because that's all about you. You should turn around and say, you know, I really appreciate the time you've spent with me today. What can I do? For you, meaning asking that person, because that makes you memorable. One and two, you'd be surprised. I've done it, and you'd be surprised what the answers are. And you think, well, I'm only, you know, I'm graduating. I can't. What can I do? But you'd be surprised, and they will appreciate you doing that. So it's invaluable. And I think the important thing on the the LinkedIn connection there is exactly what um, Tony said, which is that you're wanting to meet with them. You're trying to connect with them because you're from Roger Williams, they're from Roger Williams, and you want to actually connect with them when you move down there. The, the point isn't simply to be connected to them, it's you want to help develop the community that you're going to have down there with other Roger Williams um, alumni. Was that thank you. helpful? Yes, okay. thank you, very, thank you. Ana Barcelona. Mm -hmm. I have a question regarding um, applying for jobs. What do you do in a situation that it says entry level position, but then you need three years of experience? How do you get that experience if you're just coming out of college and all you have are internships on your resume? So, if I, if I may start with that one again, because again, we, we hire only um, entry level positions and we typically are asking for people that are previously graduated and it's zero to three years that we're asking for. And um, one of the reasons that we don't put in our ads that we're looking for somebody that's just graduating, although we will look at those resumes, is because um, what we've found is that people coming right out of school don't have any experience of what it's like to actually be in an office place. And so when they find out that sales is hard, they decide they don't like it. When they find out that they, whatever the, the quirks are of an office place and they've never been there, um, we find that we don't get 
the momentum that we need. And what we do is we train people over a two-year period so they can have a successful career in the medical field. I, I can't do that if somebody comes in and leaves within six months. I haven't even started to earn money on them myself, let alone helping them develop at all. So part of the reason that we do that is to weed out people that, for lack of a better term, are flaky. Um, if you have a lot of the things that we've talked about, you can demonstrate leadership. You can demonstrate you, that you've been involved in the Roger Williams community and other places. Then we're going to take a look at you. And if you interview well and you can perform the job of the salesperson, we're going to hire you. Thank you. Can I just add to that? Sorry, I have to be a big mouth. Um, I think you need to define what experience means for the, within the organization. If you have an internship, you're interning at Kind, and you, this is your second time around at Kind. Product management, brand management? Brand. Branch management, sorry. I've got a great memory, it's just short. Um, all of that stuff that you're learning at Kind and brand management in the food industry, I would count as relevant experience because you're actually doing that. And you need to put that on your resume and be specific about it. Most companies have a position description. They throw it out there looking for X, Y, and Z. P make sure your resume is tailored, not lied on, but tailored to those specific requirements that the company is looking for. You want to get in there, okay? You're in the dugout now. I need you up to bat, and that's how you're going to do it. I will tell you, and, and Beth and, and Byrne can agree or disagree, passion and enthusiasm wins out over anything else that you can bring to me technically. I can't teach you to be happy and passionate and enthusiastic, but I certainly can teach you how to market a brand out there in the, in the, in the, corp, in the, organs, uh, in the community. And to go back to the passion piece, so I'm doing an executive level search for president and CEO right now for a not-for-profit, and one of the candidates is kind of off the mark, to be honest with you, compared to some people that have been in the industry for a long time. But his energy and his passion, and this is just over the phone, I mean, he just engages people. And this is, you know, he's going to be potentially the president and CEO. You need to have that. And so he's going to be considered a candidate, even though he's a little off the mark. But because of the soft skills, that's why we're looking at him very closely. And there's a good chance he actually will get the job. Hi. Hi. So when you have a company in mind that you'd like to set up an informational interview with, uh, what is the best way to plant a seed? Is it an email or um, like who is the best person to get into contact with? Well, I guess to start is again to go through LinkedIn to see if there's any way you have any kind of connections, either they're Roger Williams alum or somehow through your connections that you have it that way. I mean, I think that's a good starting point. Um, from the, what, what's your major or what are you looking to do? Um, I'm a biochemistry major and there's a, there's a company uh, in Warwick that is kind of related, so um, I'm looking to go with, for that. Okay, so I mean I would try to leverage and you'll say any contacts you potentially have and if you don't then I mean I think it's flattering too for people like if you reached out to someone through LinkedIn and said you know this is what I'm looking at, I've seen your profile, you know I'd love to spend just five minutes learning more about you. Start small with them, you know, you're not sitting there saying, you know, maybe you can't ask them right then and there, can I buy you a cup of coffee, but at least you're, you're being proactive too. And, you know, the worst they can say to you is no, and people are busy, by the way, so don't take it if they don't reach out to you the first time, you know, maybe try once, you know, once or twice more, but I think that's a good starting point. If you have their email, you know, then eventually, of course, you could email them or call them. You know, I'm a boomer, a very young boomer. I mean, incredibly young boomer, but I'm still a boomer. If I ever received a handwritten note from somebody talking about my passion, their passion and enthusiasm for the organization, asking if there's any opportunity to come in for a couple hours in an afternoon, I mean, anything like that. And I know it's difficult because you've got coursework, but I want to tell you to stand out and be unique and be different from anybody else that wants to work at that organization. Do your homework know what you're looking for, be able to put that in a handwritten note and get there. If the person you saw on LinkedIn is the president and he likes to fish, go get a note card that's blank that has a big striped bass on it in a boat or, or something along those lines. Uh, if they like to go, I mean, just find out what you can about the person and then approach them from that perspective. It will stand out and it will mean something. 
Will it work? Who the heck knows? But it's better than you know, sitting there kind of wondering. We want people with biases for action. Show me that you have that bias for action. And one thing else I can't stress enough is just because they say there's so-and-so on LinkedIn, please phone verify before you do anything because people do not update their LinkedIn profiles. No. So just if you find someone, let's say it's the VP of something, don't spend the time writing the note or contacting them and then find out that they're not there. So get the phone number. All you have to do is just ask, just, just to verify they're there because I can't tell you how many times I go looking for people and their LinkedIn's are not updated. That's what the website's for. <laughs> I have nothing to add. They've, they've done a great job on that one. I have a question. Oftentimes, we're looking at job descriptions, and some of them are very, very long. When you're sourcing candidates, what is the percentage of skills that you're looking for to match that job description? Is it like an 80% match? Does it 90% match? Are you looking for? 110. What was that? 110. 110. I mean, in the old days, if you got 8 out of 10, that was a good thing. I find that clients today, and I mean, granted, we're talking entry level, so it might be a little bit different, but I can tell you that clients, like all of a sudden somebody might speak Spanish, and that wasn't on the original job description. Now we're looking for somebody who speaks Spanish, and it just, you know, and because they, keep this in mind too, because the economy was so bad, a lot of companies still see it as a buyer's market, meaning that they think that everybody wants these jobs. So, you know, the reality is, is that you, you need to be picky too. So when you're interviewing, it should be 50% that you're asking questions and 50% that they're asking questions. But you really need to kind of feel it out. Um, because there might be things on the job description you don't have, but then you need to figure out how to, you know, I don't want to say overcompensate for it, but say, hey, I might not speak Spanish, but I've done, I've been to Spain, or I've done this, or I've done that. So those are the ways to get around it. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times it's about fit. It's about being able to, to see whether the person, you come into to our offices, it's whether to see whether you'll be able to work with the people that we have, whether we'll be able to, to work with you. So I'm going to be training you. It's an entry level position. I'm not expecting somebody that is, is able to close every deal. Um, I'm expecting somebody that's going to come in and be able to demonstrate through the interview process that they work hard, that they have some commitment, that they're going to stick around. And those are the things that we're going to look for. Those are some ineffable qualities that are not necessarily in the, um, in the job description. But you certainly have to be able to speak to the ability to do the things that are in the job description through your experiences and through who you are. That answer the question. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Hi. Hi uh, there. Hi. So Hi. I have an internship opportunity that could potentially lead to um, full-time employment after graduation, and I was wondering, besides the obvious of doing well at the internship, what are some things that would stand out or that you would look for before you offered a job to an intern? Offer full-time employment. Yeah. I don't want to read this aloud, and, and certainly I want Beth and Byrne to be able to do it. Um, but that comes up all the time. It's, it's kind of 10 ways to stand out as an intern or in the workplace. First of all, stand on solid principles. Be ethical and, and, and have integrity in everything that you say and do. Don't be afraid to take a stand. I may disagree with your stand, but I'm going to respect the hell out of you for taking that stand um, from there. Put on a cloak of humility. There's things you just don't know, although I value your opinion and I want to hear it because I believe in engagement and empowerment, be humble always. Know the basic things about politics and current events. I, I have five interns this semester. Oh my God, if I see a cell phone during normal business hours, well, they just know, don't, don't. If Tony's coming around and there's a cell phone out, um, don't be texting. I mean, just don't. If you have some extra time, let's talk about current events. Let's talk about, show me that you are much stronger of a human being because you know what's going on in your outside world and not what's on that three by five Samsung, um, you know, that's in front of you. Look the part, be on time. No, 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 be early, okay? I'm a boomer. I, I mean, work to live, live to work. 
my, I'm there at 7.30. We don't have to be there till eight. I'm there at 7.30. If, I'm, if it's 7.35 for me, I'm, I feel like I'm late. So be on time and show me. And do not, do not let me stand in front of the door at five o'clock and have you race by me. I don't want to see you at five o'clock. I want to have you be coming to my office to say, I finished with my task today. Do you have anything else for me? Or do you have any extra project work that I can do? Communicate both upwards and downwards. We talked about that a little bit early. Uh, or keep your commitments. If you promise me that you're going to have something to me by Friday, it needs to be there by Friday. Um, pick up the phone. Don't text me. Unless you're, unless you're late or something like that, go ahead and text me. Pick up the phone. I like to hear your voice. I want to see you. I want to hear you. We're boomers. We're exes. Be comfortable with where you are. It's okay that you're not the president and CEO of the company yet. Okay, so just be happy in, in whatever role you, you are. And always, always finish what you start. And I'll turn it over to my esteemed colleagues to my right. So he said to dress appropriately. I'm gonna take it another level. When I was working at KPMG in Manhattan, uh, one of the women I worked with, she said, dress for the next job you want. So, you know, so maybe if it's business casual, maybe dress a little bit nicer than business casual to show that, you know, because you may be called in to go to, into a meeting that you hadn't even anticipated, or maybe a client's all of a sudden walking through the door. Um, and be careful with what you, especially like if it's business casual, women especially, because I, I actually was at Burlington Coat Factory meeting with the head of talent acquisition once, and you know, her outfit seemed fine, but then when she crossed her arms, just think about it, um, things were showing that shouldn't have been showing. Um, so just be very, very careful you with You can outfits. say that, I can't. Yeah, but, but the reality is, but I've seen, I've seen, you know, guys too. I said, you know, shirt tails are coming out or whatever. So really make sure, and I know probably money is tight in terms of clothing, but be very careful with that. Um, the other thing that I agree with Tony about, you know, being early. Um, you know, we, we'd like to see that you really want to be there and that it's important to be there. Um, there was something else you said, I think I forgot, but... Um, be ethical. Well, be ethical, but be true to yourself, too. I mean, I think if you do disagree, you know, disagree politely. You don't know everything, but, you know, and ask questions, but definitely take on projects. Like if, if you're working with a VP and there's not a lot of work there, maybe ask if you can take on a project in another department. You know, again, try to, to meet as many people and, and show your value because maybe the department you're interning with can't hire you come the, you know, the spring but maybe this other department can. And also, again, going back to what I was saying about diversity. So, so the only thing I want to know, is, Tony, are you, you're a boomer. Yes, oh, very young boomer, <laughs> baby boomer. Any, anyway, um, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, the one thing, and it goes back to the question earlier, why we don't look for people that are just, that are still in school, that when we put, a, put job in, um, ads in, it's very simple. Don't be entitled. You know, you, to, what the, to, to what Tony said, you come to work, work. Make sure you show up, you work. I, I, we've had people, um, I've worked with people in, in the corporate world and in my company where they come and they expect me to do something for them. We're paying you money, come do the work, do hard, work hard and, and you'll set yourself apart. I think one more thing I'll add is confidence. Needless to say, we understand that you know you're new to the job and you might you know you might be nervous. So it kind of goes against what we were saying before. But the phrase "fake it till you make it," I'm only talking about confidence. I'm not talking about faking anything else. But definitely, you know, we recognize that you're going to be nervous. You might be meeting a you know a client or whatever just because you're in that position. You know, you're maybe going with Burn to a meeting or something like that. So just try as best as you can to kind of fake it. Um, because I think as you build your confidence up, it, it takes some time. And but I think overall, you know, being Roger Williams students, that you'll do very well with that very quickly. Hi, uh, I am a senior, and I'm looking for a position in a consulting firm. And I've spoken with a number of companies: Deloitte, uh, McKinsey, BCG, all that kind of stuff. And all of them have basically told me that because Roger Williams is not one of their target schools, they only hire about 1% of their hirees from non-target schools. Do you have any recommendations to either become one of that 1% or other places to look for something like that? Because it's actually been very sort of depressing. I, I would find a consulting firm that's not one of the top consulting firms. I, I, I mean, 
you, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that there are places where it's better, it's easier to win the lottery than it is to get a job with one of them. Um, J and J is one of those companies. Um, those the accounting firms that you're naming is the same, the same type of thing. They want the top tier, they, they and they're going to um, weed out every single person they can that has any flaw that they deem a flaw. And, and it may not be a flaw. It may just simply be that they don't view it as view you as their perfect fit. The other thing is is that again with the downturn and just the way the consulting firms worked. I was on the consulting side of KPMG and Ernst and Young. And they got tired of the bureaucracy. You know, it was one thing to be a partner, but then when, like, uh, when KPMG went public, they became bearing point, and they all lost their shirts. Really, financially, they lost their shirts. So a lot of these partners actually went out and started smaller firms. So you're still getting the same quality of work because, but they're just smaller. And to be honest with you, you probably would get more, a lot more experience than, you know, being one of millions at some of these other firms. So again, doing your research, if you find two Deloitte partners, as an example, have gone off and started a company, I wouldn't hesitate to approach them. Um, would you say that graduate school is more beneficial to your job opportunities? Because I've heard that it both makes you more valuable, but also makes you more specialized. So would you say that overall it helps you get jobs, or kind of narrows the jobs that you could potentially have? I, I apologize. I didn't hear the question. <clears throat> would you say that graduate school improves the number of job opportunities you have, or decreases them because it makes you more specialized? I, uh, I, I had this conversation this morning with, with Julia, believe it or not, because she is um, really struggling whether or not she should go on to graduate school upon graduation or, or go out there. You know, I'm a huge fan of life experiences, so my answer is probably not going to be the right one. But my thought is, is get your butt out there, get into the workforce, make sure this is what the direction that you want to go, experience what you can experience, because the lessons you learn along the way, you keep forever. And then if you decide that you want to take your GMAT and get into a master's program or go into whatever it is that you want to go, then do it. Most, many companies pay for and have tuition assistance to help you with that nut. Because the last thing you want to do after coming out of Roger Williams is have another X amount of money that you've got to pay back to the Uncle Sam or the government for your student loans. So my thought is, is that although I do enjoy seeing graduate degree programs, I probably would be reluctant to bring you on board if you did not have some work experience before you got your, back, or your master's degree. And again, I could be dead wrong in, in what I'm saying to you, so please don't make it a Ten Commandment or don't tell Anna. She, she's really rough on me sometimes. The other thing I'll say on that is, is I think that you should, at the maybe 18-month check after you've graduated, if you decide to go the work experience route, is do the temperature check. You know, do you like what you're doing? What do you want to do? And the only reason why I say that is because for myself, um, I was a business communications major at Bryant, and then I decided I wanted to go into grad school. I was working for KPMG, as I said, in Manhattan. And the beauty of it is because I wasn't too far out, one, KPMG did pay for it, but more importantly, I got waived out of five classes because of what I had taken undergrad. So if you go too far out, you, you know, I, I, I knocked off a year that I didn't have to do for my, and I don't know if it's still the same today, but I think it, you know, if you go into the workforce, you know, maybe at that 18 month mark, you say to yourself, do I wanna go into grad school? Do I wanna go part time? I mean, I did it in three and a half years, and frankly, I didn't have much of a life. You know, I worked and I went to school, um, but I'm kinda glad I did it that way. Other people might say, you know what, I can afford to or whatever and I can quit in order. So I think 18 months is a good time to start thinking, you know, kind of evaluating again, what do you want to do if you decide to go in the workforce. But I agree with Tony, I think some work experience is, is valuable. I'd agree the work experience is more valuable than the, the MBA. I didn't get my MBA until um, I moved to Pittsburgh and I went through an EMBA program. So um, it was, it, they're great programs. I was working with um, 15 people in the U.S., a bunch of people in Brazil that were, were all executives, were all have life experience at the time, and we were all working, and so we were able to apply the skills right away and apply some of the um, problems that we had during work in the program. So I, I, I think it, it makes most sense to wait. Don't get, the, don't get it, especially if you're looking for um, entry-level positions. I'll add that a lot of the people that we've seen that 
come with the MBAs. Um, look like their, their entire work history ends up being scattered. They've, looks like they've gone into the MBA immediately after school generally because they don't know what they want to do with their life. Um, that, that's, again, that's my experience in uh, the years that I've been hiring. I, I don't know, I'll let you two speak to whether that's wrong or whether there's something different that you've seen. Unless it's like an MSW, a Master's of Social Work, you need that because your, your particular degree is that, or you're going to law school, or I mean. It, it, would, it would be for science, either biology or environmental science. Okay, where do you want to be, forgive me, I was about to say, where do you want to be when you grow up, but I don't mean <laughs> that way, but where would you, and if you look at your strategic plan, did you do a SWAT yet on you? No. Okay, let me just show this. Everyone know what SWAT is? Okay, do a SWAT on yourself. What are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what opportunities are there, and, and your threats, okay? That may help you identify those core skill sets or, or core strengths that you have and identify the weaknesses because it's all about emotional intelligence right now at this point, okay? But where do you need to be in five years? Set yourself a strategic plan. What's my one year, what's my three year, what's my five year? Okay, and then at the five year point, if your goal is to be a doctor or a research scientist or something like that in the, in the sciences field, then maybe we're wrong. If, we're, if it's something in the business field, then we're probably right. So you've got to identify where you need to be and then connect the dots through your SWOT or through whatever um, to, to get there. Uh, and I don't know if you guys want to. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually add to that. I've had this discussion with my daughter, who's about your age, um, and she's the, the situation is she's she's getting a molecular biology degree, and she doesn't know what she wants to do. She wants does she get the five year degree? Does she go for for a, a, a doctorate? You've got to go to the the people that you work with right now, meaning the professors that you have relationships with. Talk to them. See what connections they have in the business field in the, the um, areas that you're looking at, the areas you're considering, in the industry that you're in. They're not, you know, just because they work in a, a school doesn't mean that they are disconnected from the relationships that they've had and the, the relationships they've developed over the years. They're going to know people. They can help you with formulating that plan. I, I can help you formulate a business plan for business, to, to Tony's point. I can't help you with anything in the sciences. But having said that, I mean, some people, maybe you want to be a doctor and run your own practice one day, you know, maybe if that's maybe a goal. And where, you know, so you're very, you, you understand how to be a doctor, but you don't have any business skills. I, you know, I, I don't think it's bad no matter what your major is to take a business course or two, even if it's after you graduate and you just do a certificate program or just take a couple of classes. You know, it doesn't have necessarily have to be an MBA, but just to have that basic business foundation, I think for almost every major, it's not necessarily a bad thing because I work with a lot of small business owners and, and, and they don't have it. They, they don't, they've never taken Business 101 and I think that's invaluable to anybody. Thank you. Hi, so Hi. my question is about negotiating salaries. What tips would you give recent college grads? Tony? Oh my God. All right. I'll do the best I can, but I'm telling you, it's not. You, you got to trust in your gut. Um, here's the dilemma that you're in. You want the job, but you don't want to leave any money on the table because you got student loans you got to pay, and you want to have an apartment. And boy, that new car in that driveway would look really cool. Okay, and you really want a cat too, and they're expensive. So because <laughs> you got to feed them and change the litter. Anyway, you pay someone to change. All right. What you want to try to do is find out every salary in, in a company is by a band or by a range. So you want to find out the range of the salary that you're trying to look at. What is the range for this position? It's between 50 and 70. You don't want to come in at the high end because that doesn't leave you a lot of room to move beyond that because until you moved out of a band or out of a range, you're kind of, kind of stuck in that little thing. But you certainly don't want to come in at the low end. You want to try to come in at the middle or upper middle of that, like at the 50th percentile or the 75th percentile versus the 90, okay? So you got to find out from, from that perspective. Um, good luck. I always tell people don't bring up salary 
on the first interview. It's like asking someone to marry you over salad. Can we wait till dessert before we get married or before we worry about the size of the engagement ring? They're going to be more inclined, if they love you, they're going to be more inclined to give you more versus you sit right down and say, okay, let's talk about money. What do you pay me? Okay? So you've got to work that to your advantage out there in the world. I was never good at negotiating salary because I used to feel, because I'm Italian, I'm really sensitive. It's an Italian thing. But <laughs> why are you laughing? Italians are sensitive. Do any, is, are there any Italians here? Okay. Are you sensitive? Thank you. Okay. You heard it here first. Okay. So I would always kind of feel guilty, you know, from that perspective. But you should have a number that you have in mind. Do the best you can to get there. The worst case scenario is you can ask them for two things. Ask them if, they, if you are at the high range, if they would provide you a, or an opportunity for a one-time sign-on bonus. Or two, ask them if they would do a salary review in six months after you've had a chance to kind of show and prove your worth you know, from there and see if they're open to that. Um, Beth, I, you're probably better this than me because you're Beth Carter, Carter Consultants. <laughs> I think the other thing to take into consideration is let's say you have two offers. Let's say you're in that great position, you have two offers. You have to look at the bigger picture too. So maybe let's say one job's offering 50 and the other one's offering 55, okay? So of course you'd say, well, I want the $55,000 job. But the $55,000 job comes with an hour commute or like in my case, you know, commuting to Manhattan, so I had to buy a train pass. And I have to wear suits every day and I have to work longer hours, or I have to do this, or I have to do that. So, so I think you have to kind of figure out what the whole package is. The $50,000 job, too, might be that, you know, in six months' time, they'll pay, f you know, for an advanced degree, as we discussed, or you get to travel internationally, and you're not going to be able to do that with the other job. Um, you know, keep in mind, it's not what's in it really for you, it's what's in it for them. I mean, one woman I was working with, a younger woman, she's like, well, I can bike to work. Like, she thought that was a great thing. But think about it, she doesn't have to pay for anything. And if she can bike to work and she can wear, you know, not suits, um, you know, she is saving money. So there's, you have to kind of look at the whole picture. You shouldn't just say, this is my base, this is my bonus, and that's it. So you have to think about what your expenses are for the job. And then, and, and I don't see any reason just because you're coming right out of school that you can't ask for more money. If you think that you're worth 52 and they're paying 50, you know, what's the worst that you're going to hear is no. I, I mean, I wouldn't ask go from 50 to 100, but, you know, a couple thousand dollar difference might make sense. And I would also ask, what is the bonus based on? It's not always based on personal performance. You know, when I interview candidates, I say, what, you know, what's your bonus? Well, I can re earn up to 20%. First of all, when is it paid? Because when is the fiscal year or calendar year, depending on what it is. But it could be based off company performance, division performance, team performance, and personal performance. So you, if you think about it, if it's the four pieces and it's a 20% bonus, you're really only, you personally, is only 5%. So these are the things you need to think about as you, you know, evaluate if this is the right compensation for you. They did a great job. <laughs> we got two A's from Burn. We're doing well. I know. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one's in a similar vein to hers. I am on a track right now where I need to go to grad school, so I have a short amount of time where I'm going to be working in between that, hopefully another internship. I'm wondering if it's appropriate to negotiate pay in an internship for such a short amount of time, or if that's kind of stepping outside of a boundary? I, I, I don't know. If it's a short period, I think I would just take what they're, when I mean, unless it's ridiculous. What's the yeah. short period? Is it like 90 days, or is it like 180 days? It'd be a couple months, maybe like, like four months. Like 90 days, four months, yeah. 120 days? If that. What do you think, how, I mean. How much, out of, how much of the? How much are they offering? That's, how, how far out of the range is because, okay, it? 5%, so 20%, 50%? Sorry. Uh, are, they, are we talking about 25 cents more an hour, and I don't mean that in that horrible way it just came out, versus maybe $5 an hour? Are we looking at a substantial amount of money? Yeah. OK. I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I would probably, us on that one. Yeah. Wow. I, I would, if it's for an internship, I would probably See if there's another internship where I, I would have the discussion with them. 
that, and if that's really where you want to be and you think you're going to learn, well, maybe you just have to deal with it for a couple of months. Yeah. I'm open to communication. If you wanted to come to me and you wanted to sit down, make an appointment, sit down, but I would have the three or four or five reasons specifically of where you brought value to show that increased compensation and say, look, at, I don't want the substantial amount. Can we meet in the middle or try to recreate a compromise or some sort of middle ground that you guys can both agree to, agree on? Um, I'm okay with that. I mean, I don't know bosses would be that irked. If it's in the state of Rhode Island, oh my goodness gracious, they, they reimburse you for half anyway from a, a company standpoint. So, I mean, I don't know if they're going to be losing anything by keeping you. Mm -hmm. All right. And then this, okay. And question number two yeah, is? The second question. Um, so I know a guy. Um, a friend of a friend. Yeah. And he works at a firm that I love. And I'm kind of stumped as to how to make that connection. Like a search firm or a? It's an architecture firm. Sorry. A what? Architecture, architecture firm. Uh, oh, A and E. Ooh. Have you asked your friend to introduce you? Well, that's the thing. He's he's not my friend. He's an alum from Roger <laughs> Williams, <laughs> and I just know that he exists and that he went here and that he did well in the program and now he works at this place that I like. Do you have a second or third degree connection to him, on LinkedIn? Have you looked at him on LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah, okay. I do. Okay, is it, who, who do you know that could help you make that introduction that's in the middle? Because you're probably a second or third to him, uh, or that person. Mm -hmm. So who's in the middle, who's a second? If you're third degree, who's second um, that, you know, that you can ask to make an introduction to? Or if, if there isn't that person, then you could send them a LinkedIn invite, and you know, the standard line is, I'd like to link in with you, or whatever it is. You can change that and say, you know, I, I'm, I think, you know, very highly of your firm. I notice you're a Roger William alum. Again, go back to the coffee cup date kind of thing. But you can do that in a LinkedIn invite, too. I, I, I'll, I'll admit to being a boomer as well. Um, if you Sweet don't change boomers. that, I delete it. If, you, if I know you, I don't know you, it doesn't matter. You send me something that says, um, I want to link into you, and that's all you send me, it gets deleted. Don't even, it's not even a consideration. He's tough. <laughs> does that answer, does that help you at all? I feel like we, I think, I think, we, I feel like I let you down. Um, I guess. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was thinking more on like a personal level. Well, stock the crap what? out of them. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there anyone who has to leave in the next like five minutes or ten minutes that, that would like to a ask a question? Okay. Now I know why he's the star. He he really takes charge of the the room here. I have to live up to Anna's expectation. They're pretty high. That's tough. With alumni, I mean, if you're in the program or not in the program, there's the Roger Williams Career and Alumni Network. And if you're part of the same group, you can send that person a message. And believe it or not, alumni are usually very receptive. So they're excited that you're reaching out. But if you're concerned that you don't know this person and you're a little uncomfortable, you know, check with the faculty. Um, I, faculty do yes, stay in touch professors. with the alumni. So it might be a way to kind of break the ice a little bit if you think that would be beneficial. Or tell him you revoke the degree if he doesn't talk to you. <laughs> If, can, can I just take, take that a little bit further? Again, we, we started with the idea that you need to build a community of people that you can work with, build relationships. So what you're trying to do with this person is develop a relationship. You want to find out about where they work and hopefully they can help you get in there. Maybe they can't. Don't ask them to help you get in there. Find out about it. Use it as an informational interview. You know, ask the question whether or not you can help them, as, as was earlier brought up. This is about developing relationships. Relationships that you'll work with for the rest of your life, whether they're alum or they're not. Whether it's people that are in this room or it's people that have left the building. It's about building relationships. That's how you're going to develop your career through your life, from now and forever. So it, it's, it's, while I may present, the, you know, it's tough, it, 
it's you, you if you just treat the LinkedIn as a way of helping to develop that relationship, people will respect that. If you treat it as simply a way of having more names in a Rolodex, nobody cares. I think one other thing too that we haven't brought up and is you've got to be inquisitive. I mean, do you know what your, like, if you all live together, do you know what your friend's parents do, as an example? Do you know what your neighbors do? Um, do you know what all your relatives do? I mean, it, it, I asked this question, and you'd be surprised how many people don't know the answers to these questions. And you'd be surprised how that these people may be able to help you. Again, going back to the student I mentioned earlier that graduated in May, he got a phenomenal job with Black & Decker in Indianapolis because of his neighbor. So, you know, if you keep putting it out there that this is what you're looking for and talking to other people and learning what, you know, your friend's parents do and whatever, that there might be a connection that you just didn't even think about. Um, I was working with a woman at University of New Haven. She's an opera singer, if you can believe it. And I was having lunch with another woman, totally different, and somehow it came out that her brother was an opera singer in Germany, and I connected the two. So you just don't know, but if you don't ask the questions, like Thanksgiving's coming up, sit down around the table and say, this is what I want to do, and, and see if anybody, can, you know, somebody you didn't even think of might be able to help you out. So that's another way to look at it. Um, once you guys make the hire, and uh, let's say it's a long time between you made the hire and then the start date, like how much should the student or the, uh, the employee that's going to be starting, how much connection, how much like communication should you be having before you start? If it's like a long, like I know I have a year until I start, how much like communication should you be having with HR? I think that's up to the company. You need to ask that question. I make, I make those that are not going to start for a while come in at least once a month. I've got books, I've got tapes, I've got things. That I can that I can train on. I'll have them do sidebars, um, things along those lines. But that's left up to the company. Many times, because of security reasons, national security or whatever, I don't know what company it is. But you may not be able to. So I would check with HR and say, what's an appropriate follow-up, or where we, wh how often would you like to hear from me, and what is the preferred method, voice or email? Thank you. Sure. Hi again. Barcelona. Um, I have a question again about negotiating salary, but more the process for it. So do you thank them and get back to them the next day with a counter offer, or how does that work? I can take it. You can take it. We all three of us can take it. Uh, why don't you start? I'll see what you say. <laughs> you need to make sure when they give you an offer that you do not refuse it. So your, your next thing to them is, thank you very much. I appreciate the offer. I'm going to carefully consider it. And those are the words that you need to use. I'm going to carefully consider it. And then get into what Beth said. Make sure you have identify their benefits. What's the benefits going to cost you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, typically, people like people who make decisions. I wouldn't sit on it. But you can also ask the question of basically when would you expect a decision made or when would you like me to have the decision made. But I would say no more than 24 hours. The only, obviously the difference is, is if it's a Friday at 4.30, you can't do anything until Monday. But I don't think I'd want to sit on it too long. Um, Beth? I was going to say up to 48, but I do agree that, I mean, because it puts everybody on edge, and the longer you wait, I think it starts to build ill will, and that's not what you're after. So, you know, 24 hours, I think, is fair. 24 hours. Thank you. And one more question. If you're graduating in December, or if you're graduating in May, when's the best time to start applying for jobs? If you're graduating in December, I'd be applying for jobs now. I would have started back in April and May. I'd start researching as a freshman. I mean, seriously. I mean, you can never start too soon. Um, so I've applied for a few jobs, and I've heard um, kind of many different ways of drafting cover letters. Um, what catches your attention when you screen um, cover letters, like in the applicant process? Anyone. I'm the wrong person. Uh, I yeah, don't like, I am too. So I, I don't, never read I cover don't letters. Do cover letters? The problem is you have to write them, but I never read them. So. I, 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 I do read them, but the main reason we the main reason I read them is for people that do things that are obviously, um, again, for lack of a better term, stupid. 
Um, present yourself well in a cover letter, and I ignore it. Um, say things that show that you have a lack of understanding what you're applying for. Say things that um, don't make sense. Um, and then it helps me rule you out. So for me, a cover letter is simply a purpose of either ignoring, essentially ignoring it, but I read it, but I read it to see if there's any flags in it. it don't do a cover letter unless it's specifically asked. It's just another sheet of paper that can trip you up. You know, misspelling. And that's what I'm sentence. looking for. And that's what he's looking for. You know, I mean, if they don't ask for it, don't do not do it. I don't get very many cover letters. We, we ask for cover letters. Do you? And you'll be surprised Lots. people, you, 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 that's the other thing. If you, if you see that they ask for a cover letter. Oh, you have to. Provide a cover letter. You'd be surprised the, the, the resumes that we get that they don't provide a, a cover letter even though we ask for it. Bern, do you specifically say please include a cover letter with X, Y, and we Z? We tell on them it? send the resume to this email address with this in the subject and with a cover letter. But you don't tell them what the body of the cover letter should be? Not at all. So so this brings up a different point. So in your resume, we discussed this actually before we came in here, at the top of your resume that you have a career summary, and if you don't seriously consider having one, think about it. The career summary is really the only part of your resume where your personality can come through because everything else is fact. So that's a nice way to kind of sh you know, showcase like maybe what you like to do or you know, highlight that. So the cover letter would be the same thing. You don't want to just, and you do not want to regurgitate your resume. I mean, people literally co copy and paste into their cover letter. Um, so even though I don't read it, the other thing is don't do novels. I mean, I do get cover letters occasionally, and you know, the, the cover letter's like this long. That's a red flag too, because it's kind of like in an interview, if you babble after two minutes, you know, you're starting to raise a red flag that way. So kind of going back to what Burns says, it's a way to rule people out, not necessarily take you in. When I look at resumes, I know we're getting a little off track and I apologize. When I look at resumes, I do what's called what I call the thumb rule. If I have a resume, if this is a resume, I take it in my right hand, I put it in my left. What's above the thumb must compel me to read below the thumb. Make me excited about you. I want to read great things. And that's what Beth is talking about, putting them, you've got your name, you've got all that information. But then I want you to introduce me to you. I want to know what, you're, what you are, and that's where you get into a summary or profile or whatever the term is. But this here is going to make me go here. If this doesn't do it for me, I ain't going down here. It's like the first paragraph of a book. If you read the first paragraph and it's not getting, you know, getting your attention, you know, it, it's just not going to work. So I'm not going to read the rest of it. So, and then with the cover letter, well, Byrne reads them. So I guess the first <laughs> paragraph of the cover letter, if it doesn't entice him, he's not reading the rest anyways, right, Byrne? Well, but the reason that I read them is specifically to rule people out. It's, it's, I'm not reading them because I want to, I, I, I think you're going to sell me in your cover letter. I don't. I, I literally am looking for um, misspellings, poor grammar, uh, all, all kinds of things that are very easy to fix and not to do. So it doesn't have to be a long cover letter, it just needs to be a cover letter and it needs to show that you have some interest. Tell me something about my, my company that you've read on my website. I've had people, we're a small company. I don't expect you to know anything about me except what you see on my website. We're, we're not a name brand. So take the time to learn a little bit about the company to, to, to Tony's point earlier about customizing. One of the places you can customize is a cover letter. Say something that shows that you have some interest in the company that you're, you're interviewing or you're, you're sending the, the, the cover letter to. Thank you for the question, that was wonderful. Um, can you just elaborate more on the um, career summary? So for me, what I do, because I'm a certified professional resume writer too, so what I ask people, it's the first question I ask, I say, if I was talking to your friends, your parents, whatever, I say, what are three words that describe you? And I try to not necessarily get those exact words in, but I get what the meaning is behind it. So maybe they'll say you're hardworking or whatever, I might put diligent, whatever. But they're descriptors. And then I, t and then I think back about what else I've done. Um, so maybe you've traveled abroad, you know, for the, you know a semester or whatever. You want to get that in there. You'll guess you'll run it more down further, but that maybe you've traveled extensively, or maybe you have an expertise in something that already because of the internships or something like that. So, it, you know, it only has to be like four sentences. It doesn't have to be this huge thing. But the and you can you know if you go online, you can see some other ones. 
But the idea is, is that you know you want and and downplay or don't even include things you don't like to do. Like I always you know tease people when I write that I said, do you like to do report writing? And they're like, no, I don't like to do report. Then I'm like, why is it all over your career summary? So you can downplay certain things, or as I said, eliminate it if if it's really not something you're interested in. Okay, now I, in one of my classes we wrote a resume, like drafted one, and he said to include interests. Do you agree with that? And if so, would you put that in the career summary? You think? The only way I would do an interest is if, let's say, you were into biking and you're applying for a position with a bike company, maybe okay. that would be how I would get it in there. But in general, I mean, because remember, the resume is only to get you the interview. The interview is to get you the job. So it's, it's just really more of an introduction. And again, you're only getting a six second, maybe a 6.25 second read at this point. And the other thing to keep in mind is, especially if you're applying through Indeed or something like that, the person that's reading that resume is probably a year or two older than you at best. So, you know, again, you just you want to make sure, and the other thing that I will stress, I can't stress enough, is, is don't use what I call the vanilla fonts. Like, make it a little, you know, I'm not suggesting that you do these crazy, you know, types of things, but make it a little bit prettier, like, I, you know, because if I get a very vanilla looking resume, it, it just doesn't entice me to read much further too. So it's, it's the whole, because it, it's the whole package. And then of course you want to be the whole package. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on, on the summary, we, we did agree outside, never use the word objective. Oh, yeah, get rid of objective. Yeah, yeah, it's not an objective, it's a summary. I, I don't have an issue with interest if you're putting it at the bottom, or like Beth said, but I, wanted to, I do want to know what you're interested in, because I'm trying to establish common interests. So if you like fishing, or you like hiking in Vermont, um, you know, I want to I want to talk about that. I like skiing that. in Vermont. So skiing in Vermont, <coughs> you know, at Stratton or something like that where I used to work. Um, you know, those types of things, I want to, so I'll see that, but it should be at the bottom of your resume. And please, one page, you're not executives. One page resume, I'll make it pretty if you got it, you know, but just one page. And for some reason, the big thing now is lots of bullets, like, you know, the actual bullets. I'm not a big fan of that because all I see is a bunch of dots and I just want to take a pen and kind of play connect the dots. So that's just something else. We could probably have a whole seminar on resume writing. Yeah. Um, but that's, it's, it's like LinkedIn profiles. You, you, gotta, you need a, a 45 minutes on this. If you're interested in seeing examples with career summaries, um, the career planning seminar workbook actually has one. So if you want me to send you a copy, send me an email. I can email you the resume so you could see an example. Oh, it's 15. Oh, we have I think we should question. take this on the road. <laughs> the three of us. Do we, can we just wait like three seconds for them to leave? Thank you very much for coming. It was wonderful to see you all. Link in with me. I'm in Providence. I'm here all night. Me too. Oh, that's right. You're a recruiter, so you want everybody to link into you. Yeah, they're, they're, fun. they're fun. They're fun, though. I, I, yeah, do, like, do, I like when they link in, because then I turn around and I ask them what they learned. It's fascinating. <coughs> Someone's paying us. Look at this. She's got money. We're getting paid. Lindsay, Lindsay, we're getting, paid? We're getting you, paid for this. If you ever go on Cape Cod, <laughs> Osterville, Lindsay works at Wimpy's. Wimpy's is the best dinner on the Cape. I mean, for a reasonable price. If you ever in the Cape. Go to Osterville. My go to Wimpy's. My cousin lives in Osterville. Oh, you've yeah. got to go to Wimpy's. Go to Wimpy's. I'll tell her that. I was like so excited. I still like to sue at Harbor for breakfast, but Wimpy's in Osterville is. Wow. Yeah. Okay, this poor girl's one star. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes, we got. We just and off on the Cape. No, so my question is about um, online applications for jobs. So they have a form that you fill out and they want you to put your resume into it and put your cover letter. So how do you stand out when you're doing that? Because it takes away all the formatting from your resume and things like that. And then also, how do you follow up with that since you're not sending your resume to a specific person? What's an appropriate way to follow up? Do you look someone up to follow up? Things like that. I, I do the two-pronged approach. So if I would send it into the big black hole, as I call it, and then I would try to go on LinkedIn or whatever and see if maybe I could kind of figure out roughly who that person is. So let's say you're going for a finance job and you know it doesn't say it reports to the controller, but that would be kind of a close person or maybe you see a VP of finance on it. I would send my resume to that person as well. And you can say, you know, in your cover letter, the first sentence is, you know, I read with interest in on indeed.com about such and such position. Because again, the first person who's gonna screen it 
might have just graduated and they've got a job spec and they're literally checking the boxes and you might have something that they don't really see as a value, but the hiring manager or someone in that department may see it as, the, as a value. So I, I would, as I said, it, it can't hurt to have your resume go in twice um, because, and the other thing is, is with online applications, you know, you can see when it posts, but let's say you don't send it in for three days, they might have gotten a million, so you got knocked out just because you were three days into it or whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's like concert tickets. They go that quick, you're not gonna get one, right? So that's the way I would approach it. And unfortunately, because I work, one of my clients, I actually have to put stuff in the ATS. I don't particularly like ATS since I get the value of it. But yes, your formatting and all that, unfortunately, kind of get, does get messed up. So you do have to be careful with the fonts and stuff. You may, in that case, actually might have to have a little bit more of a vanilla one if it's going into you know, an online application. I despise ATS and specifically Taleo, um, which is the biggest one out there. I will very respectfully um, disagree a little bit with Beth, although the core is I agree with her. As a last resort, send it in. Try to find somebody in that company that you can have be your champion well, and walk it through because most companies provide some sort of gift, a gift card, a savings bond, I mean something for what's called an internal referral or internal company referral. So if you can get the resume to that person, it immediately gets separated from the black hole of resumes that goes into Taleo, and then that person can follow up. Because again, it's a big company policies. You're still gonna have to put that into Taleo or send it through the, the applicant tracking system, the ATS system, but at least somebody has had it, walked it over to HR, wherever the hiring manager was from there. I think the only thing that I can share with you in dealing with Taleo, and, and Beth may have more experience with that, I don't have to deal with them with Honeywell, um, is that if you, it's set up by keywords or, or small little phrases. So when somebody goes in and wants to look at a resume, they'll put like three or four keywords in and it's supposed to spit out a list of resumes that match those keywords. Make sure that the job description that you saw on Indeed or wherever you saw it, that your resume has specifically those keywords that they brought out, okay, before you send it in. But if you can possibly help it, Stay the heck away until the last moment when you just gotta take a leap of faith. I, I don't I don't know. And again, I apologize, I, I don't necessarily agree no, with the other son. No, no, I agree. I mean if you have someone that you can get to, it is definitely the case. But if you don't, I was kinda of going on the premise that you didn't know anyone, that then I would go that route. But one thing, and I don't know if Bank of America is still doing this, but it dumbfounded me that they were doing it. The recruit the corporate recruiters would send their job specs over to India and during the night while everyone's sleeping, they would be trolling around looking at either through you know, the ATS or just even through the internet, get these resumes. And so when the recruiters walked in the next morning, they, were, they had a stack of resumes that they could review. The problem that they were having, that's why I'm not sure they're still doing this, was that especially in financial services, you, get, you have to get your Series 7's license and they were getting seven Mockingbird Lane. Um, see, that, so there was some problems with that, but the point is, I know some other companies probably are shipping their requirements overseas, so you're not even getting the 22-year-old American, like, but you're getting someone overseas. So be careful with the with what Tony's saying. I agree with him completely. Make sure you have those keywords, but make sure they have them. Make sure you have it the same way. Like if it's a word that could be hyphenated or not hyphenated, make sure that it's exactly the same way because your resume could be floating around India right now. And I actually have a second question too. <gasps> really, it's like two for one. Okay. Yeah, so, so once you do send in your resume and cover letter, whether it is to a directly to a person or through one of those systems, how soon is too soon to follow up? How often should you follow up if they don't get back to you right away? You don't want to be annoying, but you want to follow up. I'll set that up on the initial um, email, and I think I just stepped on Beth's toes, and I apologize um, that she was about to speak. But um, I will say to this person, uh, send, if it's email, um, I will follow up with you on Friday to see if my resume to Lynn is safely on her desk. Or unless I hear from you in the interim, I will reach out to you via email or I'll reach out to you via phone call on Friday. I mean, give them 48 to 72 hours. If they don't want you to, it's been my experience that they'll come back and say, yes, I got your resume, don't follow up with me on Friday. It's a crapshoot. Um, it's but it goes back to something Byrne and all of us have said about establishing relationships, 
inside these organizations, people that you can have the cup of coffee with, that's the best and easiest way um, to do that. Because you're, I mean, you're fighting, you're like a salmon fighting upstream in Alaska. Not you, but I mean, that's, the, that's kind of the battle that you have to face. You'll get there, but man, those, those waterfalls are really high. All I'm gonna say is don't sound desperate. I think he covered the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, don't let him see you sweat. Okay, with applicant tracking systems, if you need help with those types of resumes, we have resources for that too. Wow. <laughs> so come and visit us at the Career <laughs> Center. I can help you. We can all help you. Um, are there any other questions just in the Oop, interest the of time? Uh, hi, my name's Tom. Um, I'm a sophomore, so I'm just kind of beginning oh, the whole Good for you like, that you're here. Thank you. Congratulations. I like that. Thanks. Um, so I'm just beginning the whole like searching for internships and like learning how to interview and do all that stuff. So I'm wondering, like, provided I get an interview, is it appropriate and like how often should I ever reference anything that's in my resume or cover letter? Like, is that something that I should bring to an intern? Uh, an intern? Uh, no, can't talk. Sorry. An yes. Interview. Yes, no, like, because yeah. I don't want to tell them what they already know. You know what I mean? Look at me on this one. You answer it. Yeah, bring it. You're talking about bringing a resume to an intern interview? No, sorry. Um, bringing up content from my resume during an interview. So. If the question pertains to that, you can refer to your resume. You know, if the person asks you the question, you can say, as you can see by my resume, or, you know, I mean, something along those lines, but. You've got to ask, answer the questions that they're bringing up, and they may, they should be bringing up points in your resume during the course of the, uh, during the course of the interview. Am I, am I missing the point? No, no, because you, you, you look like, oh my God, he's. Bleh. Well, see, that's where I'm about this whole process right what now. Is I'm like doing a whole deer in the headlights thing. Well, I think the other thing too is, is so you can, yes, you can certainly say things that are on your resume, but the other thing I'll say to you, just this is my rule of res, you know, again, what I said before, 50% you ask questions, 50% they ask questions, but also try to keep your answers to two minutes. And I just coached a woman uh, who's a senior um, at Bryant. And I said to her, you know, if you answer the question within the two minutes and then you kind of feel like you forgot to say something and that you get asked the next question, you can say, well, look, just one more point I want to make on the last question. Answer it, move on, and answer the second question. But keep it to two minutes. So if you're the type that rambles, you know, just practice. Um, that's the best advice I can give you. And if you're more of a one-word, two-word answer type person, <laughs> practice that way too. So you just need to keep practicing that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And let me just add, um, and I know uh, I, this is the first time I had the honor of, of meeting Byrne, but Beth and I have known each other for a number of years. We're here as a resource. Link in with us. Send me your resume and say, Tony, can you take about five minutes and take a look at this and give me some constructive criticism? Or Tony, I would love to come in for an interview and get some interview experience. I'll bring you in and I'll interview you as I would anyone else. Um, you know, it is something that is important to me because I'm paying it forward. Darn it, I want to see your picture on the cover of Time Magazine before I go and leave into my next uh, generation of, of whatever. So if I can, we can help at this level, we're here. We're here as a resource. Don't be afraid. Just because we're boomers, we're okay. And then after you meet with him, then really come to meet me because then you'll get the real answers. <laughs> If you but, say that I'm a boomer one more time, you're making me feel very but, you know, But the beautiful thing is <laughs> Beth and I are, are two different, but we're also very similar in the sense that we have our different styles and different approaches. Both of them work for each other because we're both individuals. So I would tell you yes, just don't say, well, Tony told me to put that. If she says no, don't do that. Don't, don't like throw me under the bus. Okay, just, I'm saying, just, you know, you know, I'll have Monica, you know, something. Okay. Hi. 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 How are you? Good. How are you? Congratulations. You're the last question of the night. <laughs> uh, Lindsay so was first. <laughs> at a job interview, uh, what kind of questions would you recommend that we ask to set us apart from other candidates? Well, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> oh, can I answer before you start okay. reading? <laughs> no, this, I've been working on this for days. This is a big deal. Um, clearly more prepared than I am. but. Um, Something that shows that you actually know about the industry or the company that you're talking to. Uh, 
again, there's been so many times that people come in that they have no idea what the industry is, no idea what we do. And this, when I was in the corporate world, the same thing. They, they didn't know who, who we were partners with. They knew nothing. And all of the information is readily available and has been for years. So at the very least, know something about the business and, and the industry that you're actually talking about. And know that, ask things about the, the, that are intelligent about the job. So I agree with Bern on that, but if, is this a full-time job you're talking about? You're about training? One of the things, I have like a little model, and one of the, it's, I call it the score model. So S is your skills, but C is culture, the C. And I don't care how great a job is on paper. If the culture doesn't fit for you, you're not gonna be there very long. So I would ask questions, what does a typical day look like? And one of the more important things is when you walk in to wherever you're interviewing, really, be very, you know, take a look at what you're looking at. Meaning like Burlington Co Factory was a client of mine and when the first time I went there, they all work in cubes and there was clothes everywhere. And I am not kidding. I mean, these were recruiters and they still had clothes all over the place. And then a venture capital firm came in and they changed everything and all of a sudden it became like this. So it gave me kind of a sense of how they operate. And so ask questions like that. Um, you know, go on LinkedIn and, and read, I always suggest to read almost every bio I can, if it's especially if it's a smaller company, or at least the whole department, and ask questions like, I noticed through my research that most of the people in this department or this company have been here 20 years. What do you contribute that to? How do you stay challenged? How do you stay motivated? Or maybe they're new and say, well, you know, what made you decide to join the company? What have you faced since then? What surprises have you seen? So the soft side is, you know, I definitely agree with Bern on the technical side, meaning like asking those very specific company questions. But on the flip side, you want to make sure that it's a good fit for you as well. Tony? Thank you. Very, Beth? Where's your list? I'm, I'm just going to touch on a couple of points because <laughs> out of respect for time. Um, the more, I, I have this saying, God gave us two ears and one mouth that says we should listen twice as much as we speak. Now, I typically don't adhere to that rule, but I'm going to tell you that you probably need to do that. I would talk to that person about themselves. How did you get your start? Why do you like working here? The more you get them to talk, the more you can manipulate your answers because they're gonna give off clues, body language, and things like that that you're going to use as power statements. For women, think of it as a guy, okay? I mean, you guys know how to tell, and you make them think it's like their idea, okay? Which is even better from that perspective. So look at this as in, in a normal relationship terms because really what we're talking about is starting a business relationship as opposed to what you typically do, which is starting personal relationships. There's just a, there's a line from that perspective. Um, what keeps you up at night? I mean, those types of questions, but be personable with that human being that you're talking to. There's two very powerful questions that have not, I've not lost on. In fact, they're on my LinkedIn profile. The first one is, is if we're sitting here a year from now celebrating what a great year it's been for me in this role, what did we accomplish together? Which is a very powerful question. And then the one thing that I will tell you after interviewing thousands of people over the few years, uh, even when I was an Air Force recruiter, was you didn't close the interview. You did everything you were supposed to do, but you didn't close me. So the actual thing is, is now you've had a chance to meet me and review my credentials or review my resume. Is there anything about my background or anything in my background that would indicate or suggest to you that I was not a fit for this role? If you'd like me to repeat it, I'm happy to do so. But you got to close the interview. You did everything else right. Close me now. If I say no, everything's perfect, then your response is great. What's the next step? Then you can do jumping jacks on the way out and say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious because you, you made it. I tell people, don't worry about it. I, I know you're supposed to ask for the job. I know you're supposed to hit home runs and all that stuff. Look, at, just get on base. We'll get you home. But to, and don't pop out to the catcher. You'll be fine if you like baseball. Um, I want to leave you with this. Um, Walter Wintel in 1905 wrote this, and I, I kind of made it more 2015, but I think it's appropriate for some of the things that you've heard with us today. If you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win but think you can't, it's almost a sense that you won't. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster person, but sooner or later the person who wins is the one that think they can. And that's the attitude that you have. Walk in there like you're going to win, and you will. And I'll see you all at the top. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
Oh, you got the clock. <laughs>